Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this Transfiguration Sunday, the end of Epiphany. Welcome to all of you who are here. Welcome to all of you who are listening on the radio or watching on Facebook Live. We are so glad to have you with us, however you are able to join us. Um, last week was such a wonderful um, week. Thanks again to Carrie and all the kids and mentors and Sunday school teachers and praise band for making that wonderful worship service happen. One of the things that we did last Sunday was we collected a noisy offering, which we um, often do on a praise band Sunday with our kids. Last week, as I think I mentioned, we had the noisy offering going straight to Lutheran World Relief to Syria and um, the, to uh, the quake victims in Syria and Turkey. And boy, did you guys respond. We are sending a check this week for $400 to Lutheran World Relief. So thank you, thank you so much. In addition, there is another thing that is happening with Lutheran World Relief that our um, congregation has been a part of. And let's see what that is. Hello, I'm Emma Wagner from Lutheran World Relief, and I'm here at our quilt and kit warehouse in Maryland, where the staff is quickly preparing a shipment to go out to our neighbors in Turkey. Tens of thousands of the quilts and kits that you all have made throughout the year will reach earthquake survivors in some of the hardest hit communities. God, we pray for our neighbors whose lives have been devastated by this earthquake. May these quilts wrap our neighbors in your love and fill them with the hope and peace that is found in you. Amen. To all of our quilters and kit makers and churches, we want to say a big thank you from Lutheran World Relief. It is your compassion that is making this quick response possible. If you'd like to give further to help get these supplies and other urgently needed supplies delivered, you can give at the link below. Your love will be on the ground and reaching our neighbors soon. So thank you so much. I, uh, I was telling Marian Bungy last night, I'm very, very confident that one of her quilts and um, some of you others, Terry, and I know I, can, I can't even see all the people here who probably have done a quilt or two or a hundred. Um, over the years and all of those quilts blessed by us and um, are now going on their way to Turkey and Syria. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, let's see, and just another announcement, Ash Wednesday is already this Wednesday, so there will be a worship service at noon and another one at seven. The worship service at noon will be followed by um, uh, the care team will be serving refreshments afterwards. So hope that you can make it to one of those Ash Wednesday services. Um, Root River Assembly is this afternoon at 2 o'clock. If you are one of the um, delegates, you know who you are. Another thing this Saturday is the Relief Recovery Rebuild event at the Fest Building. This is um, a celebration of all those many, many people, our fire department, six other fire departments, EMTs, so many more people who stepped up um, at the, the fire that was here before Christmas. Um, Trinity members sent a check, you know, your wonderful contributions. We sent a check before Christmas for $7,000. This week, we will send a second check for $6,000. So a total contribution from Trinity of $13,000 to those who were affected by the fire. So thank you, thank you so much for that and hope that you can go and celebrate. Our care team is also um, providing Cookie Lady cookies on Saturday, um, as well as the financial donation. So thank you for that. One thing that didn't make it into the bulletin, um, I was down in the kitchen earlier and um, the Strinmoans were there and I think Lynn Solberg and Deb Spence also are providing treats and they're kind of special treats. So I hope that you can all go to fellowship after worship because uh, it looked very, very good and um, not your typical um, refreshment. And I think that's all the announcements I have unless anyone else has anything. Well then let's take a deep cleansing breath and breathe in the spirit of God and breathe out all our cares and anxieties as we prepare to worship. God is with us.
table, worship begins with confession and forgiveness found on page 94 of your red hymnal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I learned this hymn when I was two years old. It is my favorite hymn, and I've had it memorized ever since. Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, number 834. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
Worship continues with the prayer of the day found on page two of your bulletin. We pray together. O oh God, in the transfiguration of your Son, you confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the witness of Moses and Elijah, and in the voice from the bright cloud declaring Jesus, your beloved Son. Make us heirs with Christ of your glory, and bring us to enjoy its fullness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
That was beautiful, thank you. <laughs> the first reading for today is from the book of Exodus, chapter 24, verses 12 through 18. At Mount Sinai, Moses experienced the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights. The glory of the Lord settled on the mountain. And on the seventh day, God called out to Moses. On the mountain, God gave Moses the stone tablets inscribed with the Ten Commandments. Here is the reading. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant, Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up in the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. We will read responsibly Psalm 2 as found in your bulletin. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed saint. Let us burst their bonds asunder and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord has them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. You shall break them with the rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Serve the Lord with fear, with trembling. Kiss his feet, or he will be angry, and you will perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Happy are all who take refuge in him. Today's second reading comes from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. At the transfiguration, God's voice was heard declaring Jesus to be the beloved Son. By the activity of the Holy Spirit, God's voice continues to be heard through the word of Scripture. Here is the reading. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of a scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel 
Gospel for Transfiguration Sunday comes from Matthew chapter 17, starting with the first verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Shortly before Jesus enters Jerusalem, where he will be crucified, he is revealed to Peter, James, and John in a mountaintop experience of divine glory we call the Transfiguration. Here is the Gospel. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While Peter was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up, and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ, and you may be seated. And grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, help us to hear your voice. Help us to listen to your voice and help us to tell others what we hear and bring your light to the world. In your name we pray, amen. Transfiguration Sunday, now that's uh, a name you don't forget except that you do. Transfiguration, it actually means metamorphosis. It means a change, a change that can happen very suddenly like in our story today or a change that can happen over hundreds of millions of years like a metamorphic rock. Um, takes a long time to form. So Transfiguration is this Sunday that marks the end of Epiphany. Since the wise men came a month and a half ago um, after Jesus was born, we had been in this time of Epiphany, of startling revelations about who Jesus is and what he can accomplish in the world. And now we have Transfiguration Sunday, the end of this time of Epiphany, when we will bury the Alleluias today and put away some of this um, this exuberance for a time of Lent. Transfiguration is this uh, transformation into a different time when we focus on different things. We prepare for Holy Week and for the crucifixion and then the glorious resurrection. So we have these four great texts that, we, that work together to bring us to this moment, that bring us to this preparation time. And here's how they work together. So we have Exodus, first of all. We have Moses up on the mountaintop. Moses goes up with just a couple of people, and it's a complete foreshadowing of uh, this time when Jesus goes up with just a handful of his disciples as well. And very like what happens with Jesus and the disciples, Moses sees the glory of the Lord all around him. And in fact, the glory of the Lord is so profound with Moses up on the mountaintop that even those way down in the valley can see the clouds and the fire, and they know that the glory of the Lord has appeared. And it's a preview of coming attractions, as it were. And it should be noted that this would be a story that would be very well known to the disciples. They would, they would know the story of Moses and what happened up on that mountaintop, and they would have that in their hearts. And so when Peter and James and John go up with Jesus, yes, there would be a surprise to a certain extent that this is what's happening up there, but that also would help them recall Moses, Elijah. We are in a tradition of God appearing in remarkable ways. So we have then Psalm 2. And Psalm 2 is, again, about more of a metaphorical mountaintop, a king on Zion. And the words we hear, a son begotten, again, we kind of have a preview of these words that will appear in Matthew's gospel. But what's most important about this psalm is what's going on all around, that there's turmoil and there's tumult. And what the psalmist calls on us to do is 
take refuge in the Lord. No matter what's going on in the world, if there's a war in Ukraine, if there's a, um, an earthquake in Syria and Turkey, if there's political tumult, if there's whatever is going on, take refuge in the Lord. Take refuge in the Lord. Then we get to this Second Peter text, and I love this Second Peter text. Um, it may have been written by Peter himself. It was more likely written by one of the associates of Peter, um, either as Peter was being martyred or shortly thereafter. And this um, text was written about 30 years after the events that we read about in the Gospel. And what I think about with this text is it's almost like Peter is writing a memoir, some of the things that happened to him while he had the, the great good fortune of spending time with Jesus. And now he wants everybody to know as he's writing this memoir. And it tells the story specifically of what happened on that amazing day when he was privileged to go up on the mountaintop with James and John and see the glory of the Lord. Now, Peter, Peter, oh my gosh, we can all relate to Peter, right? Sometimes I think about like in the, you know, remember the Brady Bunch series and it was like, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. When we read the Gospels, sometimes it's like, Peter, 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 what are you gonna do next? He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. He's kind of like us, right? He has moments of great vision and um, moments of great wonder, but then he has moments too where you're just like, okay, just be quiet right now. Just be quiet because you're not gonna say the right thing. And we hear about some of that in what I'm gonna talk about in a minute. But Peter was also the rock on which the church was built. Peter was a witness to that mountaintop experience and Peter, in this wonderful verse from Second Peter, the second uh, letter that he wrote, gives us the call that we need to hear as we're going into Lent. As Roxy just read, you will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. That's the sermon right there. That's, that, I could have said that and we could have gone home or gone downstairs for ice cream and, oh, I just gave it away. And, <laughs> and we would have been done, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more. So we have wonderful Peter who, like I said, is giving kind of his last will and testament, his testimony about what happened, what he was an eyewitness to. And then we get to our Matthew text, Matthew's Gospel, which is our intro to Lent and Holy Week. Christ is revealed. So imagine these disciples, they've been walking around for three years with the human Jesus. And certainly they have seen some remarkable things. They have seen him feed 5,000 from a few loaves and fishes. They have seen him heal the blind and the deaf and the lame. They have even seen him raise someone from the dead. But they've never seen anything like what they saw on the top of that mountain. They've never seen the glory of the Lord, and they've never heard a voice like that. Now, the, the voice has spoken once before. If you will remember, our epiphany begins with the baptism of Jesus. And so this is kind of like bookends, uh, the baptism up until this mountaintop experience. And the same thing that happened at the baptism at the river happens on the mountaintop. These same words, this is my beloved son in who I am well pleased. It's a preview also of John 3:16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, this love of son, this gift to us. But there's words that are added at the mountaintop and that is, listen to him, listen to him. And this is what the disciples need for the road ahead. They need to start listening more carefully, just like we need to listen more carefully. When I was in, um, graduate school the first time when I um, got my master's in English, one of the books that I read, now hang on for this title, was called The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. Anyone read that one? <laughs> so The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind seeks to explain brain development over many, many um, hundreds of thousands of years. And one of the things that they used um, as an example in this book is in the Old Testament and other testaments as well, 
Somehow, people are able to hear voices, divine voices, and then take action from these voices. And how the author of this book sought to explain that was as the brain developed, you know we have two sides of our brain, um, that as the brain developed, the two sides became closer together. But in previous times, the, it was more split. And so it was actually these voices that you, know, you might hear in the Old Testament were actually just one side of the brain talking to the other side of the brain. That's what the, the gist of this um, segment of this book was. And then as time went by, like I said, you know, the brain got closer together, and so we can no longer hear div divine voices, which were really just us talking to ourselves. Well, that's one theory anyway. But I have to say, don't some of us always wonder a little bit about whether it was a real voice? I mean, did they really hear voices or was it just something coming from their heart? You know, I mean, I don't hear a lot of voices these days. Maybe my brain is just too um, close together or something. But we have this testimony. We have this testimony from Peter. He was an eyewitness to this event, or as I like to say, he was an ear witness to this event. And Peter takes time after 30 years to say, no, this really happened. I was there. This, I saw the glory of the Lord up on the mountaintop with James and John. I saw Jesus revealed. I saw it. I heard it. And then we went out with Jesus, and we'll, as we prepare for Lent, they are preparing for their journey to Jerusalem. So Peter, 30 years later, either just martyred or about to be martyred in Rome, for 30 years has been spreading the good news but after that tell no one that he heard from that voice, this is the first time he wrote it down. This is the first time he wrote down what had happened on that day so that everyone for the last 2,000 years would have that record, that testimony, that eyewitness, that ear witness, that we would know this really happened because Peter was there. He heard it and he saw it. And thank goodness. But what had happened six days earlier kind of shows us a different side of Peter, a, a bigger side and kind of a smaller side. Six days before this event, Jesus is asking the disciples, who do people say that I am? And each of them has an answer. Some people say Elijah, some people say John the Baptist. And Jesus says, okay, but who do you say that I am? And of all people, who steps up with an answer? Peter. Peter, who can be kind of clumsy. Peter, who doesn't always say the right thing. On this day, Peter has the answer. You are the Son of God, the Messiah. And Jesus says, that's right, Peter. You are blessed, and on you I will build my church. You are the rock on which I will build my church. And Peter must have been overjoyed for once he has said the right thing, the right thing that will inspire all of the other disciples. But you know, unfortunately with Peter, it doesn't last too long because then the next thing you know, Jesus is describing what will happen during that week. And Jesus says, I will suffer. I will be crucified. I will die and be buried and then raised again. And Peter, just moments and you know, after having this wonderful experience, says, no, he cannot put his head around this idea that this has to happen to Jesus. No, I, I can't accept that. And Jesus says, no, it's going to happen, and you have to pay attention. You have to pay attention, because I will rise again. I will rise again. Follow me. Pick up your cross. Deny yourself. Follow me for the road ahead. Won't be easy, but it will be a blessing. On this Transfiguration Sunday, we are transfiguring from Epiphany into Lent. We are going from a turning point with the, the surreal and the real. We're gonna get real here during Lent. And it's the beginning of the end for Jesus and the disciples. It's the beginning of the end of Epiphany for us, but it's the beginning of this glorious time when we focus so closely on what Jesus did for us and what Jesus is calling us to do for the world. We can look at the words of Peter and be inspired that these were his last words, his testimony. 
You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your words, and we give you thanks for Peter, who is so much like us. In your name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn is basically a reiteration of what we just talked about. It's called Jesus on the Mountaintop, and it's number 317. continues with the Apostles' Creed found on the inside front cover of your red hymnal. Please stand as you are able. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called together to follow Jesus, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Embolden your church as it witnesses to the majesty and mercy of your Son. Equip preachers, deacons, and pastors. Move us to tell our stories of your faithfulness and forgiveness. May our lives proclaim your greatness. Bless our bishops, Elizabeth and Regina, Bless our ELCA partner congregations in Southeast Minnesota, South Sudan, Tanzania, and Colombia, and bless this congregation and all our ministries. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers. Dwell with your whole creation from the tallest mountain peak to the deepest valley. Support the work of disaster relief agencies around the world, and especially Lutheran World Relief as they get to uh, people in Syria and Turkey. 
Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers. Give shelter to those lacking safe homes. Spur communities to work for fair housing for all. Protect our neighbors whose dwellings do not keep out dangerous cold or heat. Accompany with your touch those who are homebound, sick, or isolated. And especially today, Lord, we ask for your mercy for those in our community, our congregation, and our families who are suffering in any way. For Gary Wilhelmson, Mary Lou Storley, Marlene Morkin, Ion Selness, Janet Fossum, Barbara Arnold, Linda Newgard, Pastor Bob Stoskopf, Sharon Hansen, Nadia Wold, Lois Steele, Lisa Aquad, Linda Tollefsrud, Paul Morkin, Ron and Dawn Stone, Lori Hagen Jensen, Lucas A.J. Wistie, Mary Amundsen, Anna Bingham Yeris, Rachel Krensky, Sharon Onsted Johnson, Mavis Johnsrud, Sawyer Oaks, and Jennifer Wedman, and for all those we now name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers. Make us eager to receive your word in scripture. Help us, help us recognize Jesus' voice in the needs of our neighbors. Make us confident to follow the way of the cross. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers. We bring to you our needs and hopes, O God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you always. You may share that peace with one another. Peace. pray. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care, and prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you.
On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had again given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, You may be seated. The table is ready and all are welcome. Everybody is welcome to come up for communion or you may come up for a blessing if that is what you would prefer.